What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, and don't forget to leave a comment. If you haven't hit the like already, go ahead and hit it. We're trying to get them likes up. You know, I appreciate everybody tuning in. appreciate everybody sharing the channel. I think we're at like 20,900 subscribers, somewhere in that area. But it's not because of me, man. It's because of all of you, all of us working together. We certainly appreciate you. When we get to that 25,000 subscribers, you know what time it is. We're going to help the people out that we can help. And then as we move forward, we're going to continue to help people, man, with this show. That's what we want to do. So, again, I appreciate everybody. Share the video. You know, this week I was trying to do mostly just me doing talking. Next week we'll jump back on them interviews and some other different things. You know, been reading the book a little bit. The other day I think what we were reading kind of struck a chord about Mr. Young. And, you know, it does get emotional. Sometimes you relive this stuff, man, when you're reading it and you think back. And sometimes I feel like I'm there, man. Like I'm back in the place, like I'm back in the cell. Or I'm back in that shower punching the wall. It's crazy how, you know, something like that can touch you. Or take you back to a place. Kind of like you ever listen to a song? And you listen to that song and it takes you back to a place, man. An old girlfriend, an old summer. Something like that. So that's kind of how I feel, man, sometimes when I read this book. And it is therapeutic for me. And I hope it's therapeutic for you. But more than anything, I hope that somebody's watching this show and they're like, man, I don't want to live that life, man. I don't ever want to be in that position. And you know, I can say that now. That if I would have known the things that I know now... I may have made a different choice back then where I was like, damn, man, I don't never want to be in that position. And hopefully that's how people are feeling tonight. So, I don't know, we're going to do chapter 22, 23, and uh, 24. <clears throat> so chapter 22. Mr. Young is in better spirits. Must have been the hot shower. I climb into my bunk and pick up the book I was reading. Concentrating on the words that fill the page is difficult. Miss Hack clouds my mind. Mr. Young is staring at me. What the hell are you thinking on up there, boy? He asked, his southern drawl emphasized, and molasses slow. Oh, nothing, Mr. Young, I say with a smile forming on my face. Nothing my ass, he argues. What is it? I chuckle at Mr. Young's use of profanity. He seldom throws cuss words out of his mouth. I was just thinking about home and a little bit about Miss Hack. Mr. Young laughs. I feel a little embarrassed admitting I was thinking about the prison secretary. Boy, she sure is purty, ain't she, he asks. What the hell is purdy? Do you mean pretty? Oh, hell, you know what I mean. Well, Mr. Young, she is an attractive woman, and her whole demeanor makes her even cuter. What are you going to do, Chad, if you ever get out of here? Mr. Young asked, raising an eyebrow. I looked down at him from the top bunk. I have to get out of here first, Mr. Young. Yeah, well, we all have to get out of here, but if and when you do, what are your plans? I have all kinds of plans, Mr. Young. A lot of dreams, but at the end of the day, I just want to be normal. Have a good job, good woman in my life. I'd like to have a son someday. Coach his football team, take him fishing. All the things we're supposed to do. That's the stuff that would make me happy. Simple things, Mr. Young. Simple things. Do you believe in God, Chad? Of course I do. Well, you better start praying for a blessing. When the feds get you, can't no lawyer get you out of here. Only person can get you out of old Big Sandy is God. I was raised on that Bible, and there are blessings to be had if you work for them. Oh, Mr. Young, I pray for one every day, I respond. Did you like that old boy they were jumping on the other day? A uh, dog pound or whatever they called him? Yeah, he seemed like an all right dude, I responded. Well, Miss Chase said the boy ain't dying now, so he's all right. It looked to me like they stabbed him good. Thought he might have died. Yeah, it looked bad, Mr. Young. He's going to live, so that's a pretty good thing. Don't much like seeing people die, Chad. Seen plenty of it in Vietnam. Seen some bad things there. And if I don't have that PTSD shit by now, I will when I leave here. Since I've been here, I've seen some god-awful things, boy. For the life of me, can't understand why these boys in here want to kill each other. They're lost, Mr. Young. Most of these people are never going home, and if they do, they know they're going to be old. Too old to do anything but their lives. So, life as they know it means nothing. They lash out at other people. I guess it's their way of dealing with their anger, pain, and hopelessness. What do you think about that, I ask? Me and you put it like that, I see it. Don't mean I agree with it, though. Neither do I, but I think it's the truth. These guys have no incentive to do the right thing. Good time is a joke. And the ones who ain't never going home, what do they got to lose? There is no response when I finish speaking. The, shot how, the hot shower has relaxed Mr. Young. I hear him breathing hard. 
I look over the side of the bed to see him fast asleep. Within two days, the lockdown is lifted. The usual hustle and bustle of prison life is back into full swing again. Big Sandy almost left some more children fatherless. This place almost claimed Dog's life. How quickly he's been forgotten around here, but not by me. The violence in this concrete city is shocking. Mr. Young has learned what really happened with Dog. Quick to share it with me, he motions me to our cell. Dog was drinking wine with Josh and his battle buddy. Someone handed Dog four stamps that they owed Josh and asked Dog to put the stamps in Josh's room. In his drunken stupor, Josh accused Dog of pocketing the stamps. Dog claimed he put them in Josh's room. Words were exchanged, and before long, fists, knives, or broomsticks were flying. Dog's life hangs in limbo over one dollar. The end result is Dog wound up in the hospital. Josh and his partner went to the special housing unit. They won't be in there more than a few weeks. They will be back on the compound to wreak more havoc on this place. The prognosis on consequences for violence around here is bleak. The person who will suffer most is Dog. Once released from the hospital, Dog will be housed in the special housing unit for much longer than the two others. Dog will be in a solitary cell for four or five months, waiting to be, waiting to be transferred to a new prison. For his own safety, Dog cannot come back out to the population here. Stabbing people here is the norm, with little to no consequences for such violence. That makes stabbing practically legal behind the razor wire. In the real world, I imagine morality would prevent a person from lashing out and stabbing another person over one dollar. There is no morality here. Moral turpitude pyramids even the lowest levels. It's a new set of rules when the door slams behind you and the foam smiley face shoes come off. Dog's new home is not special by any measure. I see nothing special about being locked in a cell for 23 to 24 hours a day, five days a week. Prisoners are allowed to go outside where they are locked in a dog kennel a little bigger than the cells they are living in. It's nonstop action in Big Sandy Shoe. Keeps the guards busy. The usual action consists of hunger strikes, cellmates fist fighting, stabbing matches sometimes, and staff assaults. Even in the shoe, prisoners figure out ways to make vulgar prison shanks. There is more. One of the most despicable assaults that happens in the shoe is called shitting them down. Shitting them down is usually reserved for staff. Prisoners will urinate in a container, mix that with feces, and store it for days. When a guard opens the food slot, the prisoner will fling his concoction at their target. This is usually done when a prisoner feels he has been dis disrespected by a guard. But some men have mental health problems and will shit him down for no other reason than a good laugh. Many of the cops that work in the shoe go out of their way to make things harder on their wards than they already are. Most staff members have a natural dislike or hatred toward the men imprisoned here. Guards like to make life miserable for prisoners. They fail to realize that imposing punishment is not part of the job description. Punishment comes from the court. Guards shouldn't be handing out punishment. Guards throw prisoners' mail, court-approved legal documents, personal photos, and other property in the trash. Guards withhold meals. Guards intentionally skipping a person waiting for his court-mandated one hour of fresh air is the norm around here. These small violations call, cause prisoners to lash out. Other times, guards provoke prisoners into physical altercations, thus justifying five or six cops beating a man into oblivion. The shoe also has what are called four-point cells. Inside the cell, there is a bed, fastened in the middle of the floor with latches in four different places. A prisoner is laid on the bed with his left hand handcuffed to the left side of the bed. The right hand finds the same fate. The left ankle is then cuffed to the bottom left side of the bed. The same for the right. When the Federal Bureau of Prisons four points a man, they strip him of all dignity. Most times, they leave the person naked in that position for hours. Some men cry, others scream for hours, while some hardened men lay there quietly, accept their fate, all the while contemplating their silent revenge. This is our American system of justice, breaking even the toughest of men. One hour of outside recreation, five days a week, is important to a person in the shoe. It is the only form of relief for a person left in extreme conditions. Denying a person this opportunity for no legitimate reason, other than being nasty, guarantees anger. With anger comes the desire for revenge. Men always want to cause pain to the person seen as the oppressor. Chances to seek retribution are far and few between. So when opportunity does knock, an open food flap on the door, for instance, shitting them down is the usual retaliation. Cops in the shoe are a renegade breed. They come off as fearless. Some of their bravery comes from the fact that they know the men in the shoe are locked behind steel doors. 
and when they leave the steel enclosures, their hands are cuffed behind their backs. Most prisoners in the shoe are celled with another prisoner. As most things go around here, whites are housed with whites, blacks with bad, blacks, Hispanics with Hispanics. Going into a shoe cell can be dangerous if you don't already have a relationship with the convict in the cell. Some prisoners want to be left alone, others have mental health issues, and some are violent just because. If there is already a prisoner in the cell where the guards are placing someone new, guards will open the food flap and handcuff him before opening the cell door. The new prisoner will be put into the cell and the door closes on both men. A person walks into a cell without any clue about what kind of weapon the other guy might have. Someone must have the handcuffs undone first. One guy's hands are free, while the other guy is still handcuffed behind his back, defenseless. If the convict in the cell dislikes the new occupant or simply does not know the guy, sometimes he assaults him. Guards will not open a shoe cell door until they hit the deuces and other staff respond. Many prisoners have found themselves on the receiving end of a vicious attack, sometimes stabbed while handcuffed behind their backs. The shoe is a lonely place. Each cell has a toilet, a sink, two metal bunk beds and a shower. Some cells have a desk with a chair. Everything is bolted to the floor to prevent them from being moved or used as weapons. Nothing stops the innovative prisoners from cutting knives out of the steel, sharpening the metal on the concrete floor, and turning the object into a killing machine. This is Dog's new home after being the victim of an assault over four stamps. One dollar. I doubt Dog stole four stamps from anyone, let alone a gang member. The attack was motivated by some other reason. It was likely Dog's East Coast roots in, the, in conjunction with his choice to associate with the blacks. Most of the white gang members at Big Sandy are from the West Coast. A natural vein of enmity between white West Coast convicts and East Coast convicts runs deep in the federal system. Josh and his people must have asked around about Dog's status and gotten confirmation that he was a loner and not in the black car. If they were told he was with the blacks, the assault would, have, would not have occurred. There are many unwritten rules behind these dark walls. One is that people do not assault people in other cars or other races. If Dog is with the blacks, then he's black, although his skin is white. Walking the compound, putting on a facade that you're with a car you're not actually with, trying to be a loner, makes you fair game. I suspect this is what Dog was really doing. It made him vulnerable, and, pr and the prison machine ate him up and spit him out. Once Josh and his cohorts found out Dog's real status, they set out to eat him alive. The four stamps and the accompanying theft allegations were nothing more than an excuse to lash out against a white prisoner who associates with blacks. There are plenty of made-up reasons to savagely hurt people. USP Big Sandy is riddled with them. When the consequences are no more than two weeks in the shoe for the instigators, Men here don't think twice about gruesomely hurting someone else. The violence behind the razor wire is already wearing me down. Each violent act I observe seems to destroy a small piece of me. The senseless violence here will never cease. It only festers in this environment, fed by sinister convicts trying to escape their own dreams. Trying to escape the demons that landed men behind these walls for grotesque amounts of time, some forever. The free world has written all of us off as animals, barbaric, savages, and deserving of whatever happens to us behind these cold, gloomy gray walls. We're all human beings, or are we? Have we transformed into savage beasts in a lawless land of misfits? I look into the mirror. A small tear falls from my right eye. I know that Big Sandy is slowly hardening my heart as well. We're going to move to chapter 23. As is his controlling manner, the Viper has ordered another meeting. Everyone in the car has been told to skip dinner and be in the yard on the first recreation move. Something must be brewing in his evil mind. I want to skip the meeting, but there's no way I can. Missing any kind of summons from Steve could send him over the edge. Missing Chow pisses me off because it's the first time we are getting real food. The bologna and cheese sandwiches get old quick. I pass the chow hall, hungrier than a Hebrew slave. The smell of cooked chicken wafts over my senses. Anger engulfs me more and more with each step. I inhale the warm summer air, taking in my surroundings. I see him in the distance. The viper is in the east corner of the baseball field. Walking toward him, I make a rough mental count of the men that Steve sees as his soldiers. He basks in the spotlight of what he sees as his worshippers' attention. My rough count is 73. The numbers are increasing. There are new recruits here, mostly East Coast felons. 
Some are here looking for protection. Others truly worship Steve as their god of gods, the man who saved their blood from being spilled. I wonder how many really despise the Savior. I laugh at the thought internally. Curious convicts look on from other parts of the yard as we form a circle around the viper. The number of combatants in our small prison army shows unity and strength. Steve, the vicious viper, has been recruiting new guys from other places. North Carolina, West Virginia, two guys from Texas, and one big fella from Oklahoma. We are all labeled independents. Most of us dislike white gang members for good reasons. For years, white gang members oppressed white prisoners who simply wanted to do their own time. Independents have now learned that we have the strength in numbers. With numbers, we no longer have to be victimized. Most independents have a desire to rid the prisons we are in of white gang members. Steve has installed these thoughts in all of us. This way of thinking is part of his sales pitch. His dream of prison prominence intensifies with each waking day. With a hand raised in the air, Steve brings silence over the men. His leadership qualities and his way of grabbing the attention of the heartless felons around him reminds me of President Reagan's abilities. His voice erupts. I just want to make sure all of you guys are here. As you can see, our car is getting bigger, and I'm pleased with that. We need to all start coming together like this once a week. You know we are all brothers here. There are some new youngsters in our ranks that need to be schooled. Plus, we need to know who everyone is. One of the reasons I call this meeting is because of these fucking white gang members. I'm fed up with them, always trying to oppress their own race and bowing down like cowards to other races. They're running around here talking that white pride shit while buying dope from the jigs. Everyone knows what's happened to that kid from Jersey, right? Everyone answers yes in unison like good kindergarten students listening to their teacher. I see a gun tower window open. The guard inside makes sure we can hear him chamber a live round in his rifle. Just a little notice that if things get out of control, he's there, locked and loaded. Steve continues with his lecture. Obviously, he was with the blacks. He was here before we got here, but we gave him the option to ride with us, to come back home. He made his choice, and everyone sees what the choice got him. None of his so-called people helped him. That is why you men need to know that what we got here is a brotherhood. Each of us are our brother's keeper. We have to have each other's back 24-7. People nod their heads, dazzled by Steve's words. The Viper continues. Is there anyone here who really does not want to be a part of this car? If so, speak up now. You can walk away with no repercussions. I almost raised my hand, but the no repercussion thing is a lie. There is no honor among thieves. In here, your word is only as good as the person you give it to. If you leave the car, you're turning your back on your brothers, meaning your blood is worthless to this group. Just reminded, as they are, about what happened to Dog, who would leave now? I talked to Adam, Dennis, and Ronnie about this. No objections from them. You can walk away, be on your own. Steve pauses, giving us all the time to think. Giving us all time to think. On your own, you can become a victim to these white gang bitches or have the niggers rape you. Steve says this sarcastically, but he delivers the message. We understand the meaning. I keep my hand at my side like everyone else. No one jumps at the offer to walk away from the car. Everyone in the circle is likely thinking the same as I. Those thoughts are of Dog and his desperation as he looked around for help that never came. I consider the possibilities. The blacks trying to extort me or any of the many other things that lurk in Big Sandy's dark waters when you're alone. I am convinced once again that the car is my only option. Walking away could be detrimental to my health. I stay silent, choosing what I think is the better of the two evils. There is a food chain in prison. Those alone are at the bottom waiting to be eaten alive. And there are many bottom feeders housed in here, the lowest of the low, looking to scrounge from whomever, whenever, and wherever. Some will take by force, some by fear or manipulation, while others will take by stealing without the victim knowing who the predator is. Steve's words, being raped by the blacks, are used to install fear, a manipulative tool at his disposal. Rape happens, but not too often. Homosexuals are a dime a dozen around here. If any blacks raped a white prisoner, it would be a transgression so severe it would set off an explosive firestorm of violence. When it comes to raping someone from another race, physical violence is not a possibility. It is a requirement. All repercussions to the wind. Rape would turn into death for the perpetrator. The rapist would be the target of many. Some would get him. Someone would get him. The rape comments were simply to shake up the new guys, to cement their com commitment to the car. If they want protection, they need to become the protector. Strength in numbers prevents rape. 
The Viper raises his hand, quieting the masses and grabbing the stage once again. I'm done with it. I'm ready to get rid of these gang members. I haven't called the shit yet, the shot yet, for the sake of all of you, but I ain't taking much more of what they are putting on us. So everyone needs to be on point, ready for battle. If you get the word, we got a baseball game, bring your cleats, that means it's going down. Be here suited, booted, and bring your knives. We'll meet right here. I don't want none of you brothers alone. Find someone in the car that's in your unit so you can hold each other down. We're getting on the battle buddy system. Be with that bro all the time. Hang out. Going to chow. The shower. Yard. Wherever. When you go to the shower, have a point, man. Adam chimes in. I hope everyone can see and feel the friction between us and them scumbags. There's animosity. They are watching us. They are worried we, we get our numbers up. Don't think for a minute that they won't try to make a move on any, of, any one of us. Stay safe and be careful, men. We say our goodbyes, shaking hands when the rally comes to a close. Hunger swells in my stomach. I reflect on Steve's specific instructions not to be caught alone. Maybe his own paranoia is causing him to overreact. But in this environment, anything is possible. And no one wants to get caught slipping. Scared people do unimaginable things. Scared people want to leave someone else's blood on the razor wire rather than having theirs dripping from it. There are only 40 white gang members here. The Boston New York car has a little over 70. Other small independent white cars despise white gang members as much as our car does. The Ohio independents have about 20 guys in their ride. Their shot caller is a man serving nearly 300 years for armed bank robbery. Almost every independent white car hates white gang members. If we went to war with the gang members, others car, other cars would join in the disposal of them, including ACES. The independent movement has gained traction amongst white prisoners in the federal system. It was born out of years of gang members oppressing white cons who had no backing, no help. White prisoners were forced to fold to white gang members' demands. Those demands came in many forms. Money, commissary, family forced to visit and bring narcotics into prison, being told they were not allowed to change television channels, being moved from cell to cell, being forced to live with the less desirable prisoners. Many times knives would be cut out of their beds and lockers. When guards discover these alterations, the white non-gang members face the consequences. Oppression at its best in this unforgiving prison world. Oppression at the hands of those who claim to love their own people and wanted to lift up their race. The DWB gang has always been one of the most brutal oppressors. DWB stands for Dirty White Boys. The name says it all. When a gang's name starts with the word dirty, everything that comes after is pollution. Some prisoners have family with money in the real world. Others have their own money and people in the real world controlling it. In a maximum security federal prison, any prisoner with significant financial resources might as well have an X marked on his back. He is an instant target. Gang members will key in on a prisoner like this. They are easy to spot since they always go to commissary, have nice things, and usually receive lots of mail and visits. Once they determine a mark has money, a plan is devised to extort the unsuspecting victim. The older potential victim, the better. Older men scare easier, especially when they're new to the prison system. Someone like Mr. Young would have been a perfect victim. His lack of money is the only thing that saved him. White gangs plan these exercises in extortion to the ninth detail. Everything is always carefully laid out. You can start with a gang member bumping the target at the microwave, followed by, watch where the fuck you're walking, old man. That same guy might cut in front of the target at the washing machine or in the chow line. He might ask the old man, what the fuck is your problem? This is all part of the intimidation, all part of the groundwork. Afterwards, two other white prisoners might pay the old man's cell a visit. Heavily tattooed, imposing-looking creatures are usually chosen for this part. They inform the prey that the guy who has been bumping into him and disrespecting him does not like him and wants permission to hurt the old man. This is when all the pr prison movies, the stories that Mark has heard, start to manifest into reality. The old man has become the star of the show. Two protectors have showed up in the nick of time to save him, just like in the movies. The two tattooed cons promise to keep the mark safe from the disrespectful maggot pestering him. All of his problems, worries, and fears will disappear in exchange for a small, shall we say, stipend every month. The initial fee might be $2,000, $300 every month thereafter. It's always explained that the one is better off paying rather than checking in or dying. To the victim, it always seems like paying the money is the easiest option. Once a mark pays, the gang swings the door open all the way. The victim has exposed his hand. They recognize his fear. He will live a miserable existence at the hands of guys his children's age. The people who should be looking out for him have placed him in a mental version of a WWE cage match. John Cena has delivered an attitude adjustment. 
These two pieces of filth may stop by the old fella's cell for a candy bar or soda whenever they feel hungry. They may want other small things, rice, sausages, some beans, anything to sate their hunger. The person who got this all started is part of the same gang as the protectors. He leaves the victim alone. No more problems from him, but the victim, victim's problems have escalated. This was all part of the plan. All three participants reap the continuing benefits of their extortionate scheme. These people never have enough. The prison wheel grinds slowly forward. Before the victim knows it, the oppressors are in his cell again, this time to renegotiate their contract, as if the economy has called for higher payments. Stress, anger, and anxiety are only a few of the emotions that describe what a person experiences under these circumstances. This was not supposed to be a part of his sentence. He did not ask for this. His only fault? Age and financial resources. The hyenas will move in and devour him slowly, piece by piece. The same thing happens on the African plains. All wounded gazelles suffer the same fate. Dirty white boys in every sense of filth. This is one of the reasons the independent movement formed within this concrete jungle. Now it's gaining power. Hatred for all white gang members has slowly begun to form in me as well. It has only taken months for my anger toward them to come to a boil. As independents, often we stop gang members from preying on innocent victims. This creates fiction between us and them. An explosion is destined to happen. The ingredients are being mixed in the kettle. A violent clash is imminent. The only question is when. Secretly, I cannot wait. I too have pent up anger that I want to unleash on those I think deserve it. Prison politics embrace neither mercy nor compassion. There are only three responses to an extortion attempt. Checking in, fighting back, or paying the cost. In the moment, fear causes people to take the easiest available option. In prison, rash decisions tend to be the wrong ones in the long run. Regardless of his age, when the first bump comes at the microwave, the old man should swing at the bully. Cops will respond, the fight will be broken up, and the old man will go to the shoe penny transfer to another prison with the all-important good detention order. A detention order is a sheet of paper explaining why, explaining why a person is being housed in the shoe. If a person checks in, seeks protective custody, the paper outlines that. If it is for a fight or investigation, the protective order outlines that as well. This single piece of paper can either be one's saving grace or one's doom. When a person is transferred to another prison, other prisoners will demand to see the detention order. If it says the wrong thing, the prisoner will be assaulted on the spot, and the shoe will be his home for years. He'll go from prison to prison. With a good detention order for fighting back, a prisoner paves his own way. The extortion attempt will likely be the last one he experiences. Gang members know how to apply pressure and who to apply it to. Most people want easy prey. A person who fights back is a problem. Extracting money from a person who fights back never happens. Everyone loses, including the gang members, if they push the wrong person into the corner. We outnumber the white gang members, and I'm looking forward to the eruption between us and them. Backing them into a corner gives me a small sense of joy. My heart hardens more and more, especially toward them. Secretly, I like the hardening. <clears throat> Chapter 24. In here, sports is one of my only stress relievers. Softball season is about to start, and our shot caller, the Viper, is starting a team. Most people enjoy softball, playing or watching. I quickly learned that softball is Big Sandy's favorite pastime, but even softball comes with violence, contaminating my escape from here. Although the team is being made up of guys from the car, Steve wants to name the team the Boston Red Sox. As a Yankees fan, it's hard to play for a team with that name. I prefer to play on another team, but once again, Steve would never allow it. Because I'm already in the car and a good ball player, I have no choice. Steve enjoys the game, and not wanting to play for him could get me beat off the yard. The way he would spin it is that I turn my back on my brothers, and I'm now part of the Vipers Red Sox organization. Softball is a way to get outside of the razor wire. It gives me something to look forward to in a place where meaning is hard to come by. For most men in prison, sports is an outlet, whether softball, basketball, football or handball. Playing occupies your mind. When you're involved in an athletic contest, competing against others, you're focused on the game, not on prison politics. You find yourself somewhere else. You might be behind Yankee Stadium playing handball or at a high school football game back in Texas, perhaps at a basketball game on a court in Baltimore. You're anywhere but here, anywhere but Big Sandy. A man's worries and troubles are gone for the moment, mentally erased for that short period of time. It only lasts for as long as the game goes on, but it is a break from the internal mental struggle that comes with each waking day in prison. 
Steve is the pitcher. I am on second base. Our shortstop is Luke, the best shortstop in the prison. Ronnie from Lowell, Massachusetts is on third. Adam has left field. When the other pieces are mixed in, we look like the team to beat. Ronnie comes off as a real tough guy. Like Steve, Adam, and Dennis, he came here from USP Beaumont in Texas. Beaumont is nicknamed Bloody Beaumont by both staff and prisoners. Because of the violence, USP Beaumont was closed for some time. All the prisoners were transferred to other prisons. Many were sent here. Some say Beaumont makes Big Sandy look like child's play. If Beaumont was worse than this place, I am thankful I never made it there. United States penitentiaries or USPs are designated for the worst of the worst. They are mostly designated for the worst men that society has to offer, the most violent, the most ready for mayhem. These prisons are holding centers, are holding centers for society's undesirables, and I find myself here. I am one of our castaways simply because I exercise my constitutional right to a trial. The prosecutor offered a plea offer that could have resulted in a 10-year term, which would, have, which would have sent me to a lower security prison, a federal correctional institution. Because I didn't accept the plea offer, our criminal justice system sent me to a United States penitentiary. That has nothing to do with either correction or rehabilitation. Every breath of fresh air here could be my last. I have known this since day one. My reality and every other prisoner's as well. Federal correctional institutions or FCIs have less violence and prisoners are rarely stabbed or killed in those facilities. While my goal is to get out of prison, the more realistic goal is to make it to an FCI. Whether I will make it is anyone's guess. For now, I'm here with the Lions. It does not take long before the one thing I actually find a moment of happiness in begins to crumble. Just like crackers in a fat man's hand over a hot bowl of soup, our softball team is turning into dust. With their two strong personalities, Steve and Ronnie begin to clash on the diamond. Ronnie is from a city in Massachusetts that is home to one of the best Irish fighters to ever get in the ring. Irish Mickey Ward. The poverty-stricken city breeds tough guys. Steve is his own tough guy. Mixing the two is like mixing water and oil. Steve is the first to quit the team. Adam follows. Ronnie abandons the team shortly thereafter. We no longer have a team. With its demise, my joy is gone. All we have left is a skeleton of a team. Missing key players, we go from team to beat to team that cannot win. Once Steve quit the team, he showed me his true character. Steve's a quitter. More and more I can see through his facade. Occasionally something will happen in life that will change one's opinion of someone in, an irrefer in a different way. When that happens, it shatters the idea someone has built up around that person. If the Viper cannot handle the operations of a prison softball team without quitting, then how can he run the car or send young men into a prison battle? Maybe he is not a Viper at all. Perhaps he is nothing more than a small garter snake. Today I'm forced to see Steve for the person he is, the fallible human he has always been, no longer the viper to me. He is simply an egotistic maniac serving life, bent on controlling everyone and everything he can until he is found out. Until other people see what I see, he will remain our shot caller. Any respect I had for him is gone. Steve is a master manipulator, good with words and stories of his life experiences. These stories captivate people, draw them in, and give Steve followers. And with followers, power. That power enables Steve to be the shot caller. So many of these men need a leader because they cannot think for themselves. In this dangerous place, Steve is the comforter for so many. Falling under the spell is easy. I did it just like the rest of the men in the car did. Our new Red Sox team is one in five. We have come fodder for the prison's hecklers. Although we are not good, I see the team as a plus because it takes me out of prison and gives, me some of the, and gives some of the others a small piece of fun. Anything good in Big Sandy rarely lasts long. Like most things here, baseball season will shatter like a plate glass window colliding with a boulder. It's a warm Saturday afternoon. The sun is shining. A cool breeze blows through the yard. It's the fifth inning, and by some miracle, we are winning. The batter hits a pop fly out to the outfield right behind our shortstop. Luke backs up and makes the catch. He raises his hand in triumph, a form of bravado as if he just won the World Series. During Luke's performance, the guy on third base tags up, running home to score a run for the Mexican team. Good catch, Luke, but why don't you fucking pay attention? The guy at third just ran home, I snarl. Luke doesn't like being scolded. He replies, man, suck me. What did you just fucking say, I ask? Giving Luke a chance to retract his statement. All eyes are on me and Luke. Everyone knows he just committed a prison sin by inviting me to suck him. We are walking towards each other. My fury starts to rise. My glove comes off. Luke removes his sunglasses. In a nonchalant matter, he says, 
I said you and everyone else on this field that don't like it can suck my... I do not let him finish the sentence. I hit him with an overhand right, followed by a left and another right. A hook to the temple finishes him. Luke falls to the sand, covering his nose with his hand. His pride devastated. He gets to his feet slowly. Blood falls from his nose to the sand. He knows he just broke two separate cardinal prison rules. For his violation, his nose is broken. You never invite anyone to your midsection. Not in here. Never another race. The opposite team was filled with Mexicans. I'm not the only person Luke's words invited to his love muscle. He invited them as well. Had I not handled it immediately, this could have easily caused a bigger issue. A guard manning the yard stares directly at us. It is a given. We are heading to the shoe. The cop calls us to the fence to inquire. The softball hit you in the face, correct? He's giving a chance for some reason. He's giving us a chance for some reason. Luke stands there with an expression on his face that says, You just seen that guy hit me. Why are you asking me that? Get me out of here. Nabs, another guy in the car, speaks up. Of course the baseball hit him. He's okay, right, Luke? He says this as he slaps Luke on the back. That's like they're old pals. Yeah, the ball jumped up and hit me, Luke says, while covering his face with his bloody T-shirt. Do you need to see medical, the guard asks. Nab answers for Luke. No, he's all right, CO. He's a big boy. We got him. Nab puts his arm around Luke and guides him out of the guard's earshot. Listen, you stupid motherfucker. You're going to apologize to those Mexicans and the guys on the team, or you're getting butchered out here, you piece of shit. You're going to be the dick sucker. And when you're done, you and I, tough guy, we're going to see Steve and Adam so they can deal with you. Nab's stern Rhode Island accent scares Luke. Nab's has been in for six years on a 15-year bit. Both of his parents had passed away since his arrest. When they died, some people said he went crazy. Drug use, alcohol, and violence. Nabs has no problem stabbing another man without hesitation. He is known for this. He always has a knife on him. These are not idle threats. Like a scolded schoolboy, Luke apologizes to everyone for his disrespect. His own words could have killed him. In the penitentiary, people are always looking for a reason to send things spiraling out of control. These may seem like small things to those in the free world. This unforgiving world twists them and makes them big. Makes them big. Angry men tend to make up reasons to unleash their pent-up anguish, to vent on other prisoners. <clears throat> My first physical confrontation brings me new respect. Violence is the one thing everyone respects in this dungeon. When people recognize that you are a person who inflict or resort to violence, other convicts respect you. Fighting is rarely a fair endeavor at Big Sandy. Today I was able to put on a little show, demonstrate that I'm good with my hands. I was an accomplished amateur boxer growing up. Using my hands comes naturally to me. But knowing how to fight well could turn out to be a problem. If people fear you, they will not hesitate to use a weapon or send five guys at once to attack you. Putting my fighting skills on display may or may not be a good thing. Time will tell. Letting Luke's transgressions go unanswered would have been worse, though. It would have left me looking like a punk, a coward. Under those circumstances, I would have been the one answering to Steve and Adam. Expressions of cowardice aren't tolerated. That would have been my one-way ticket to the shoe after a savage beating. As expected, Steve is unhappy with Luke's actions. The issue causes others to remember that there was a previous issue where Steve got drunk and invited another guy to his groin. Where Luke got drunk and invited another guy to his groin. He was slapped around for that offense, although what Adam had wanted to do was throw him over the upstairs railing. Instead, he was given a pass and warning to watch how he spoke to people in the future. What really saved Luke was that his gunsmith was that he's a gunsmith and thus valuable to the car. He was the car's primary knife maker when the car's arsenal had to be boosted. Luke would spend countless hours scraping lines in the steel beds with stainless steel tools and cutting knives out of beds. Luke would then sharpen the metal into fine points. In prison, knife making is a long, tedious process that most don't want to undertake. Luke would do this task for hours, never growing tired. Now that the car's weapon stockpile is sufficient, Luke is expandable. According to Steve, the broken nose is not adequate punishment. Steve wants Luke stabbed for his second violation. Other guys in the car who like him advocate on Luke's behalf. They call for a beating that results in him leaving the yard. To appease the soldiers, Steve reluctantly agrees to the beating. After all, Luke had two strikes, not three. But Luke's out all the same. Two missiles are selected. One is a younger guy from Pennsylvania named Bolts. The other is called ID. Neither man objects to the order to assault Luke. This brings a smile to Steve's wicked face. He basks in those who never object to his direction. In a sick way, I think it excites him that he has this manipulating power. The hit happens that night. Luke is sitting at the table when Bolt sneaks up on him. 
a lioness in tall African grass. Leather gloves on, bolts swing wildly from the side. Luke does not fall, but he is stunned. Adi strikes from the other side. Luke screams out in agony and falls to the floor, gaining the guard's attention. I watch from atop the steps as both men kick and punch their helpless victim. The attack continues until more staff arrive to separate the missiles from their target. Luke is lifted off the floor, beat up, bloody, and likely relieved to be getting a transfer far away from this car, this place of despair. If that is all it takes to get away from Steve, maybe I should volunteer for a good beating. A ridiculous thought, maybe, but desperate men think of desperate measures. I cannot fathom any other place being worse than this. Fathom any other place being worse than this. There's nowhere that's more volatile than Big Sandy. Maybe I should take the change. Maybe this isn't a bad idea. Bolts and Idea are both cuffed up. They look up at Steve for praise. He stands at his cell door like a proud father. Bolt lo Bolts looks at me nodding his shiny bald head as if he's telling me I owe him now. If he thinks that, he is sadly mistaken. People like Bolts and Idea are always trying to prove their worth to Steve. They come in all shapes and sizes. Little do they realize that Steve couldn't care less about them. He has his own agenda. Using these slugs to achieve his agenda is just part of the plan. Prison, right? <clears throat> Some people listening, man, today they got a family member that's in prison. People write me, hey, man, my cousin's in Big Sandy, or hey, my son's in Big Sandy, or hey, my husband's in Victorville. I mean, that's the life, man. You want the truth, there it is. The truth staring you in the face. That's how people live in prison. And unfortunately, we get people like Steve, right? We get these shot callers that are, that have nothing, man. Life is over. Life as they know it is over. So they want to control something. At least that's how I seen it. They want to be in control of things. They want to attack other people. They want to use other people because it gives them some sort of enjoyment. And it also makes them feel like they're still important. Because everything that was important in their lives is gone. They're serving life sentences. And just so you know, I believe Steve is one of the people from the movie The Town, right? He was, you know, that. at least that's what he would tell people. And I believe it to be true, 100% true. Him, Anthony Shea, a couple of the other guys. Um, but this is the prison life. This is the life that you will live. And sometimes, and here's an example. You got the New York-Boston car, right? But we got guys in there from... <clears throat> different places. There's guys in there from Georgia. Bolts was from Pennsylvania. You get these guys in the car and they're like, look, man, they're not from New York or Boston, man. They're like, who cares? You know, they, they treat them like, and the word that we use in prison was lames. So they say, hey, man, them dudes are lames, man. We're going to send them on the mission, bro. They're lames. Who cares? But these dudes are not smart enough to even realize that they're being used, that they are lames. In the prison context. And I don't mean to call these dudes lames because you know what? I don't even like using the term, man. Because no one should be called a lame, right? People should just be people, man. But they use people like these guys to just go out and do things. Go stab this guy. Go go hit this guy. And the guy might be serving a 12-year sentence and he goes and stabs someone and now he kills him. And now his 12-year sentence becomes life. And eventually he realizes while he's serving his life sentence, most times, this happens in a lot of cases, most times guys start to realize Damn, man. I did all this for this car. Where are these guys at now? You're not even around these guys anymore. 15 years later, man, you're sitting in a new USP and all the mother cats are home. Or the shot caller, he's over in Lewisburg somewhere. They're not sending you a dollar, man. They're not helping you with your commissary. 25, 30 years later, all your people are gone. Now you're an old man sitting in a cell. You should have been home 20 years ago. But you're not going home now because you wanted to prove a point to your car. And that brings me back to the kid we interviewed yesterday, Lumpy, right? Like Lumpy said, he was all for it, man. He was all for it, and it took a long time for him to realize. It took me a long time to realize. It takes a lot of us a long time to realize, man, that you know, we're doing horrible things to people, man, for little to no reasons, like we're doing bad things. And years later, man, you regret it, man. Years later, you feel bad about what you've done to people, man, because you realize men and dudes didn't deserve that, man. They didn't deserve us to stab them or beat them or kick them in the head. They really didn't deserve that, but that's what prison is. It's a machine. It's a disgusting machine that chews you up and spits you out. Shot caller. Steve wanted to be the shot caller. A bunch of you probably watched that movie Shot Caller, right? That's what, you know, Hollywood wants you to believe. You know, a lot of shot callers are like that, dude. You know, big dude, boom, boom, boom. But some of the shot callers aren't always big dudes. Some of them aren't always violent. 
but they have these leadership skills where they can send other people to be violent. You know, think like Charlie Manson. Look at the shit he had people do. Crazy, right? And that's how the prison machine works. That's how it really works. <laughs> and I say it, man. I want to say it again because I want it to resonate. That's why I repeat myself sometimes. I need it to resonate that this is a machine that will chew you up and spit you out. It will turn you into dust, man. It's not a nice place. It's not a place you want to be. It's not a place you want to live. Do you want to be a lame? Do you want to be a missile? We call them missiles too. Hey, man, we need two missiles. Adam and Steve would be talking. Adam was my celly. Who are we going to send? Well, how about this guy? How about that guy? That guy's from Oklahoma. Yeah, fuck him. You know, Adam was always a joker, man. So he'd be like, yeah, let's send him. Fuck him. But really, he meant that. Fuck him. Who cares? Who cares what he does? Who cares if he kills the dude? Who cares if he goes to the hole for the next five, ten years? Who cares if he gets a life bid? Like, these dudes didn't give a shit, man. They didn't care who they sent on a mission. You know, of course, they wanted to keep the the guys at the top of the food chain in the car safe. There was some unity. I'm not going to lie to you and say that there wasn't. There is a sense of family, a sense of brotherhood in there, right? But not with everybody. You might be in the car and be like, yo, man, these are your brothers. You're like, yeah, right. I only fuck with these three dudes over here. That's it. Those are the dudes I really care about. The rest of these dudes, man. And that's just kind of how it goes. That's just kind of how it is, man. You know, reading the book, of course, it brings back memories. It makes you think about it. But more than anything, it makes you say, man, for real, I don't ever want to be there. I don't ever want to be there ever again. Remember I talked about the baseball field and dudes playing basketball. You might feel like you're back in Baltimore if you're from Baltimore. You might be on a football field in Texas. That was your only escape. At least for me, it was my only escape was playing sports. And sometimes I felt like I was there, man. I was back on my high school baseball team. I was back in the park playing basketball. Or maybe you're behind Yankee Stadium in New York, the old Yankee Stadium, right? And you're back there playing handball. It takes you out of prison, man. But it's only for the moment. You're only out of prison for the moment. Then when the handball game's done, it's not Yankee Stadium no more. It's not that football field when you walk off the football field playing flag football in federal prison. It's not that football field you were on in Texas no more. Now you look up, and reality is staring you right in the face. And you do. You see the razor wire dancing in the wind. The wind blows it. And you say, damn, man. Ain't. I'm still here. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. I hope you got the message and I hope it touches something. I hope it strikes a chord and I hope you share it, man. Like I always say, I'm not perfect and neither are you. But I hope that we're all a work in progress. Blood on the Razor Wire with respect until tomorrow we're out.